Hey everyone, thanks for joining us again. Talking about futures this time, uh, another asset class that we work with. Uh, obviously explaining the purpose of it. We need to uh, classif classify various future markets. This is really just gonna be a memorization. So we'll talk a bit about that. List the major terms of a contract, define open interest in futures, and describe the challenges that we face as technicians when working with futures data and, and how we get around those. So obviously what are futures? They're binding contracts between a buyer and a seller to perform a transaction at a set price on a set date. Now where this all started um, way back when was uh, in the, the Dutch markets. Uh, they started with futures, again on tulip bulbs. It was one of the, the reasons why tulip bulbs went through the major crash, you know, major boom and then bust, was because this new instrument was getting written. But what it allowed um, them to do was basically a farmer could say, right, I'm planting um, wheat or corn or whatever, and I know I want to sell this, but I'm worried that the price is going to drop when everybody else starts harvesting as well. So I want to lock in a price now. So they would lock in a futures price, a uh, futures contract for that, um, and the buyer would say, yep, I'm happy to buy that because that allows me to control my costs. I know my cost in advance. From the buyer's perspective, the buyer thinks prices may go up. So they're happy to lock it in um, and also uh, make sure that there's enough supply um, for them. So that's the contract. The, the farmer can plant, can grow the crop and can do everything they need to do knowing that they have a fixed price for selling the goods at the, um, at the set date. Um, they're used to reduce uncertainty for both sides. Uh, and so it makes it much easier for the businesses to continue. Consumer knows the price that they will buy the, the um, commodities at. Although typically what happens in futures markets is that it's not really a relationship between the farmer and the elevator. So often what we see in the Midwest is these huge elevator owners and they buy the commodities off the um, farmers and they store the wheat, the grains, etc., and then on sell them to um, uh, basically bread makers and, and the consumers of those goods. Um, but even in between that, we often have speculators. So we have speculators that are coming in and basically taking the other side of the transaction, and they're doing it not because they ever expect to take delivery of the commodity, but they're doing it purely to make money. Uh, speculation uh, and so um, there's a lot of those and they provide liquidity as well so even though there may not be a commercial buyer for the goods there's usually speculators that will take the goods or take the contract from the farmer uh, with the intention to on sell it to the consumers later on so terminology that we have maturity same as bonds it's the date at which the contract ceases and the goods must be delivered. Now, sometimes we don't actually deliver the goods anymore. It's really um, going to cash. See, if I have um, a futures contract, uh, sometimes, as I said, they are, it is actually for the physical delivery of the wheat. And if you had that contract at expiry and you didn't on sell it, then truckloads of wheat could roll up and be dumped uh, on your driveway. Not that that really happens, um, but you do have to be aware of that. Mostly though nowadays, if you have a contract and you hold it all the way through, it's usually settled for cash. It's settled at the price um, delivered. Uh, and so obviously one person's going to make money um, out of that. One person's going to lose value out of that. Uh, but the maturity is the date where that contract ceases. Volume is the number of contracts traded each day. Open interest is the number of contracts outstanding. So when we have a farmer who has the physical goods and he comes to market, he's writing a contract. There is a new contract being made between him and a buyer. But both of those, the farmer may say, oh, the price of wheat's going up. You know what? I want to get rid of this contract and write a new contract. So he sells his contract um, to, to deliver wheat to someone else. Uh, and so speculators go on and like that. But that transaction doesn't increase open interest. Open interest only increases 
as more and more contracts are being written. And then as contracts are being fulfilled, open interest drops. So that's why there's a real difference between volume and open interest um, in futures. Front month is the nearest delivery month. It's the next expiry that's going to happen. Active month is usually the front month, but sometimes the most active month may be one month back. So sometimes as we're getting a close to the expiry, a lot of people are saying, well, there's no point buying the contract now because I'll, it'll close out in four days time. So I'm going to buy the next contract. Uh, and so the active one is the one that has the most volume um, being traded. A continuous contract is a synthetic price where we take all of the contracts and say, right, um, March is the current front month. Now, even though many commodities, especially the metals and things, trade in quarters, so March, June, September, December, we still call it the front month. So March may be the front month, um, and then as that expires and we get to, so usually it's like the third Thursday, or each rule for each different commodity is different, but there's an expiry date. When that expires, then the June contract takes over and, and it's the June that's contributing to the continuous price uh, as we go. Uh, settlement is a fulfillment of the legal obligations of the contract, can be physically delivered, usually settled in cash. Settlement price is the official final price of the day. Now this is where it can be a little confusing because settlement is at the end of the contract. It is the settlement of the terms of the contract. But settlement price is a daily thing. Uh, well, it can actually be intraday as well. But it's basically the price at which that future is at on that day. Uh, so it's the official final price of the day. And where it's used is by brokers um, to make margin calls. So if you have a future and you have a future to, um, you know, you're, you've bought um, a, um, a future on uh, wheat, and then the price of wheat is dropping, well then there is a margin. There's a margin between what your obligation is and what the price is. And so the broker looks at that and says, oh, I'm not sure you have enough money in your account, so we're gonna do a margin call and require you to put more money into the account so that um, we can fund that transaction the way it stands today. Commitment of traders is a report put out um, by the uh, Futures Board, I don't have the name here, CFTC, I forget the exact name uh, of it, uh, but it's a report that's put out and it looks at the open interest. So all the brokers, the exchanges, report to this government organisation uh, how many contracts are outstanding and by what class. Is it the provider, so is it the farmers or the big um, bakers or manufacturers that are using those um, goods? Or is it the speculators and the money market and the money managers um, in there as well? But what we can do with the COT report, it's really interesting because we can break that up. So you can see we have commercials, large speculators. Large speculators are anyone who has more than 250 contracts. Um, and then small speculators is basically anyone less. And we look here and say, okay, when the line's up here and on the positive side, we're saying commercials are predominant long. It counts the open interest on long contracts and the open interest on short contracts and subtracts the shorts from the longs. So when we're predominantly long, we can see commercials are here, uh, the market's going up, and then commercials are getting lower and lower and lower. And we get to this point down here where they're really short. And then going on from that, the market's going down. There's a general belief that the commercials are predominantly correct um, when it comes to this. So if we see commercials starting to roll over, then there's a pretty good bet that the price is going to go down um, as well. Now, part of the reason for that is if commercials are predominantly short, well, that's because there's a lot more selling going on. There's a lot more farmers selling into the market. And so supply is going up, and so price is going to go down. So 
I, I, I take a little bit of issue with the simplicity of saying commercials are always right and small speculators are always wrong. No, it's not that. It's just the fact that when commercials are short, it means that there's a lot of supply going to come into the market, supply demand economics, cost price is going to drop under those circumstances. Um, so important to watch that. Speculators, uh, again, you know, when they're really, really long, um, you know, and these are the large speculators, well, they're going to be closing out those positions as well. And so this almost like polar opposite between the large speculators and the commercials is sort of what leads to a bit of a sideways market there. Uh, and you can see that happened again here, where we had big polar opposites and then a sideways market. Uh, nevertheless, commercials definitely are the one to follow. You know, again, the common belief is that small speculators are typically wrong. Uh, so just uh, watch out for following them. If they're short, expect it to go up. Mind you, I still say, looking through here, I think they got it pretty right there. It's just in here where they, they didn't. Um, but yeah, that's the Commitment of Traders report. Just again, at this point, just having an understanding, when we get all the way to CMT3, we actually create indicators from this, and there's a whole trading methodology uh, that we use on COT data, which is really interesting. All right, futures terminology, bias, basis, sorry. The relationship between prices and cash. So of course, you know, when we're talking about, let's say wheat, um, you know, there's a futures contract that says, at June, we're going to deliver and we have a price for that. But there's also a price for going to the market and saying, I need wheat today. What's the price today for me to buy it? Uh, and so, you know, there's that basis, uh, which is the relationship between the two. Contango is a term you have to know. It's like um, the normal yield curve that we talked about in fixed income. It's when you look at the, um, the length. So if we take, take um, I can't quite see, uh, it looks like corn. So we take corn here and we're looking at March 2019 and then we're looking um, out at December 19 and then March 20 and December 20 and we look at all of those contracts we would expect there to be a rise. The further you get away from today and the expiry is much further out, we would expect the price to be higher. If for nothing else, it's because of the, um, the cost of holding money. So if I'm gonna hold money for two years, well then I would expect two years of risk-free interest at the very least um, to be the premium there. Um, so we call that contango, it's the normal pricing of futures. But backwardation is actually the opposite, where uh, today's contract is a higher price than the one um, in two years time. Now typically that may happen because there's a general feeling that um, commodities as a whole has rolled over. So when we have, when we talk about intermarket analysis, we talk about um, bonds rolling over, then stocks rolling over, and then commodities rolling over. Well, if there's an anticipation that commodities are about to go into a bear market, then we see the backwardation happening. And it really is a key to watch out for. Again, it's a very much a sentiment type indicator to say, hang on, most of this, this futures market believes that the price is about to um, roll over and we're going to go into um, a bear market for futures. All right, looking at the major asset classes, so raw materials, they're grouped into seven major categories. Agricultural, so corn, livestock, coffee, wheat, soybeans, etc. Energy, oil, gas, electricity, uh, are common ones there. Equity and equity index, so S&P, um, indexes, the S futures on indexes, uh, what we're dealing with, but also on um, futures on individual stocks. Not quite as common, you don't really see that happening as much, but they are available. Uh, some countries different, you know, some countries it's a bigger thing than others. Foreign exchange, we can have futures on foreign exchange movements. Uh, something we do as an Australian company is we mitigate our currency risk. Uh, and so we try to do that with um, futures and options as well. Uh, interest rates, we have futures on interest rates. That's what we're saying in the bonds section. Typically as technical analysts, we actually don't do the analysis on the price of bonds as much as we do on the futures of baskets of bonds. Uh, that's a lot smoother and easier. Metals, 
um, you know, the hard. Often this can be broken into precious metals and industrial metals. Uh, again, you may see questions about that because that's really how the old curriculum talked about. Uh, precious metals being gold, silver, etc. Industrial metals being copper, zinc, that type of thing. Um, but in the new curriculum, it's just grouped together as one, one class there. And then other, we can have futures on freight, real estate, weather, uh, that type of thing uh, as well. So continuous charts, this is actually the biggest issue. So when we talked about the learning objectives, what do we need to be aware of as technical analysts? Uh, and it's really having a data set that we can do analysis on. And so we wanna do it on continuous charts because we then have multiple years of history. Um, but how do we do that? So there's a couple of different rollover methods that are mentioned. Uh, there's the time rollover, as soon as March 31 hits or whatever the end of the contract period date is, then uh, instead of the continuous file getting its prices off the March contract, it then gets its prices off the June contract going forward. Activity rollover is basically as the March contract starts to end, the volume starts to drop. At the same time, the June contract's volume starts to rise. When June starts having a higher volume than March, well then June's prices are being contributed uh, to the continuous chart as well. Uh, so that's another way that that uh, works. There's another type actually that um, we have available and that's a GAN contract. So GAN back in the 1920s, 1930s, he would actually take all of the March contracts and glue them together. So when March 2019 finished, well, that continuous file got March 2020, uh, and then that added. And it was just a different way of looking at it. And so, you know, something that a lot of people do look at, but if you ever hear someone talk about a GAN contract, well, that's just taking the same expiry month from year to year and stitching them together. Rollover with adjustment, um, when a new contract is used, all history in the continuous file is adjusted. See, when we have this change, maybe for whatever reason, June had more of a premium. And so there's a little jump up uh, if we don't do an adjustment. So what we basically do is say, okay, let's go back through the history and make a slight adjustment to push all of that value up so that it, it matches the, um, the value of the June contract that we're now using. Two schools of thought on that, you know, uh, especially the subjective purists like the, the GAN type traders, they hate um, having adjusted data because all of their price levels are being moved. So we don't adjust our history by default. Uh, we just leave it raw. Um, but then you've got other people who are saying, well, you know, if I'm doing this analysis and particularly on um, indicators, I don't want that jump affecting my indicators and I want to do back testing on this. Well, if I'm doing back testing, I really do need to have adjusted um, futures as well. So, you know, very difficult to uh, please both groups at the same time. So we try to have options as much as possible uh, to help them. Uh, smoothing data from the two new contracts. So this is a different way where as the March contract expires, so both prices for March and June are both contributing to the continuous price, but they're a weighted average. Take the average of March and then we take the, um, the June price, but March's price has a full 100% weighting, June's price has none. And then as we get closer and closer and closer to March expiring, we get to the point where March contributes nothing, June contributes everything, and that creates a much smoother um, continuous chart. There's no jumps and things like that. All right, so that's futures, a quick one there. So the purpose of the futures markets, uh, hedging risk and giving certainty to primary producers, that type of thing. Uh, classifying the various ones, you've just got to memorize that. Know the different categories uh, that, that are there. Uh, list the major terms of the contract. Define open interest, that it's contracts outstanding um, and that transactions don't necessarily change open interest, but it does change volume. Uh, describe the challenges that we face as technicians. All right, we'll continue on with the next session.